This is how it usually plays out. You're on date number four with that cute guy Craig from Bumble and it seems to be going really well. Then he casually slips in a comment about your ovarian future. It's a great salad. So are you at that age where you're thinking about freezing your eggs? That look on my face is a mix of horror and realization, and both are linked to Craig's f***ed up idea that I and I alone carry the burden of healthy fertility with an aging body. And that idea is rooted in the ever-dreaded biological clock. The biological clock is a phrase that's had a few different meanings over time, but is typically used to refer to how female fertility specifically declines with age. Hey guys, I'm Sana, and this Sunday we're going to talk about the history of the biological clock and how capitalism has a lot to say about my eggs. And if you like this video and other stuff that we do here at Because Facts, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and that bell to get notifications. Do it right now, right before we get into it. The actual phrase biological clock wasn't always used to refer to how long women had until their reproduction ability plummeted. It used to refer to the human body's circadian rhythm, how you sleep, when you sleep, when you wake up, that sort of stuff. Moira Weigel, author and scholar of gender and sexuality, notes that that phrase came to mean something very different in the 1970s. The phrase biological clock, in the sense that we use it now, enters the popular imagination, the popular lexicon, at a very particular moment in American history. It's the late 1970s. It's sort of after this period of real flourishing and advance for the feminist movement and the women's movement. In fact, Weigel even pinpoints the day it enters a popular imagination, March 16th, 1978. That's when Washington Post columnist Richard Cohen wrote a piece in the Metro section called The Clock is Ticking for Career Women about how even though career women seem to have it all, they are still not fulfilled until they can have a baby. To a certain extent, the biological clock is naming that real phenomenon, but I think that the purchase that it gains in culture generally cannot be separated from changes like the entrance of large numbers of middle-class, college-educated women into parts of the workforce that they had historically been excluded from women using contraception and abortion to delay motherhood. So it's no big coincidence that the year Cohen used the term biological clock to refer to women's declining fertility is also the same year that we see the first so-called test tube baby conceived through in vitro fertilization. So at the same time that you have this increasingly widespread discourse in the American media about declining female fertility and anxiety about the biological clock, there are major advances taking place in assisted reproductive technology and in in vitro fertilization. And we'll talk about the fertility industry and IVF in just a moment, so hold on. Now, the idea of a woman's fertility competing with her ambitions in life continued to develop in the media and pop culture throughout the 80s. You're 31 years old and the clock is ticking. No, the clock doesn't really start to tick until you're 36. The 90s. The daughter of my sister is getting married. My biological clock is ticking like this. And the way this case is going, I ain't never getting married. And the 2000s. A lot of women today, for whatever reason, are starting their families a little later. So they want to know, how much time do I have? And there's something very chiding, something very uh, scolding, I would say, about this discourse saying that women who thought that they could have it all, who thought that they could have education and have careers and still have families are taking a serious risk of ending up alone. Now, Dr. Lynn Westfall of Stanford Medical School does note that the focus on women's reproductive aging is fair when we compare women's fertility to men's. The focus on fertility has to focus primarily on women because all women will eventually become infertile if they live long enough. There's no way to prevent menopause. Eventually, all the eggs will be depleted from the ovaries, and that usually happens around age 50. And at that point, there are no more eggs, and a woman cannot get pregnant naturally. While there's a chance that men can reproduce in their 80s or 90s, that doesn't necessarily mean that their sperm is in great health. People are not as efficient as, at reproducing as a lot of people think. We know that a normal fertile couple in their 20s has probably about a 20, maybe 25% chance of getting pregnant each month on their own. By age 40, that falls to about a 5%. We have focused a lot on the health of the woman, but the health of the male is very important too. Research from 2012 found that male reproductive aging mattered for the mental health of the child, specifically increasing the risk for schizophrenia and autism. 
Relatedly, but not connected to aging, research from 2017 found that between 1973 and 2011, sperm count in men from 50 different Western countries had fallen between 50 and 60 percent. Studies have shown a decline in sperm counts around the world. The decline in sperm count is not a problem with our technology, so we can overcome that. The aging of the egg and decreasing quality of the egg, we don't have a way to correct at this point. And while Dr. Westfall makes the point that the focus on women's reproductive aging is warranted because we do have an end date, aka menopause, it's worth exploring when and why that became such a focus in the media. The emergence of the biological clock as something that specifically refers to women's fertility came about in the context of the women's rights movements making significant gains in the 60s and 70s. We're talking about the Equal Pay Act of 1963, Roe v. Wade in 1973, and the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978. American women, especially white American women, not only had the opportunity to control their reproductive future, but also enter the workforce in greater numbers than ever before. In her seminal book, Backlash, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Susan Faludid describes the era of Ronald Reagan's presidency as an undeclared war against American women. One of the problems threatening the American family and therefore the fabric of society was that women were having children at later ages. According to the Centers for Disease Control, between 1970 and 2000, the median age of a first-time mother rose from about 22 to almost 25, and the national birth rate had been falling for almost two decades. In 1957, the average American woman had three and a half children. By 1976, that number had fallen to one and a half. While women in the United States in particular were and are still choosing to have children later in life, the conversation has focused on that being the result of this competition between motherhood and ambition. And that's very much still the case. Take for example Anne Marie Slaughter's viral Atlantic piece, Why Women Still Can't Have It All, and Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In. But recent research indicates that women who are delaying motherhood might not be doing it because of their careers. Medical anthropologist Marsha Inhorn found in a recent study women who are freezing their eggs aren't doing it out of career ambitions, but because they can't find the right partner. And if they are delaying motherhood because of their career, that's because corporate America by design was meant for men, not for women, as Wagle points out. The idea, again, that we see again and again throughout the history of this biological clock conversation is that if women are having trouble balancing work and life, or fitting the patterns of their lives, their personal and biological lives, to a corporate system that was not designed to accommodate women. The solution is not paid leave, more generous childcare benefits. The solution is an expensive technological fix uh, that is out beyond reach for many, for many people. That technological fix has given birth, no pun intended, to an entire industry that ultimately works off the fears of college-educated working women. Okay, pun intended. I mentioned earlier the first IVF baby was born around the same time that the biological clock metaphor entered the American imagination. And it was a huge deal, by the way. Women who previously were unable to bear children because of blocked fallopian tubes, fertility issues, or even survivors of ovarian cancer were able to finally have kids. Today, thanks to other technological advances like egg freezing, fertility is a huge industry estimated to hit $4 billion in 2018. But while the fertility industry is growing, it's also been criticized for overselling. While IVF and egg freezing are presented as part of the solution for career-oriented women who want it all, their success rates do decline with age. Around 40% of IVF cycles result in babies for women aged 32 and younger. Not even 10 years later, for women aged 40, that success rate is cut in half to less than 20%. And even then, these treatments are financially out of reach for many, if not most, women. Freezing your eggs can cost around $11,000 for a single round of retrieval. Plus, there's a storage fees to keep your eggs safely frozen, anywhere from $250 to $1,500 annually. Then there's IVF, which can cost around $12,000 per round, plus three to $5,000 for the necessary hormonal drugs. 70% of women who get fertility treatments actually go into debt. And while sperm freezing and storing, which by the way is different from sperm banks, is becoming a thing among men due to concerns about sperm count and aging, it's nowhere near the same industry as it is for women. So is this really a solution? And is there really a competition between ambition and motherhood? And is the biological clock real, Sana? Can you just say yes or no? 
Well, it's complicated because women do have an expiration date on their fertility. But as Wagle points out, we can't divorce the way we talk about the biological clock in this country from the history of women's labor. This idea that professional women, educated women, are going about their lives wrong, that they're organizing their lives the wrong way, prioritizing the wrong things, not setting enough stock in traditional ways of doing things is yet another expression of this cultural anxiety that we see throughout the history of dating about people of all genders, but women in particular, getting more control over their personal, professional, intimate, reproductive lives. So have any of you guys actually had any kind of sperm freezing or egg freezing ads targeted towards you on social media or anywhere? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to like, share and subscribe and let us know if there are any other health stories you want us to cover.